Welcome to Equitable Libraries, designing library programs for all learners. We are so grateful that you are spending a bit of your afternoon with us for a robust and dynamic conversation and important webinar. My name is Muna Algaithi. I'm an early learning engagement specialist with PBS Wisconsin. And I've had the privilege of being on this journey of, of unpacking and discovering and exploring mm -hmm. concepts like those that we're going to be covering today, like race, racism, bias, and equity for mm -hmm. years. And I'm honored to get to facilitate the session today with Lacey. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lacey Sheldon. I am the Youth Services Director at McIntosh Memorial Library which has been awarded Wisconsin Library Association's Library of the Year for 2022. So I'm really pleased to be here with everyone today. And I worked with Muna previously as a member of one of the PBS Kids cohort groups. So very glad to be here today. Thank you, Lacey. Um, we are going to get started. Um, if you've ever attended a PBS Wisconsin webinar, you'll know that we are always very interactive. Um, and so we strive to bring in your voice constantly throughout mm -hmm. our webinar because that is what helps build community. You have come here to not only learn from us, but to learn from one another. And so I really just encourage you to be present and to share, share your voice as often as you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. The first activity that we're going to do today is on our Padlet, um, which I just posted in the chat. If you're not familiar with Padlet, take a look at the screen and I'll show you what it might look like. Um, it's essentially a wall and you can ignore the rest of these buckets. We're gonna be exploring those later. Today, you're just gonna focus on this. Right now, you're just gonna focus on this first section here which asks you what questions you're coming into today's webinar with. And so all you'll do is press that plus button there, you'll mm -hmm. type in your response here, and you'll press publish, and then it'll post right here. And I can see there are already a handful of folks who are doing that. So take a moment now to reflect on what questions you're coming in with today. You all signed up for this webinar for a reason. You all committed for an hour and a half with us for a reason. And we wanna be really responsive to your needs and your interests. So please take a moment now to write in, right here in this section, what questions you're coming into today's webinar with. Thank you. We'll give you about a minute, minute and a half for that. The first person has responded, where am I at in the scale of creating an equitable library? Hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that visual of a scale, of a mm -hmm. spectrum, right? Where are we in the journey? What are the key concepts my students should be aware of when they are brand new to our program and brand new to teaching in school libraries? Mm. I'm teaching a new class in the fall for these folks. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. I am new to my library and my position, so I'm kind of looking for a temperature check. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome and congrats on, on your new position. <laughs> Best practices to make sure our library is equitable and diverse for all visitors. You're mm -hmm. definitely going to get some of those today. Resources, hoping to learn more about author and literature resources for diverse authors and topics. Mm -hmm. Lacey is definitely going to help you out with that today. <laughs> What are other folks doing to build and maintain equitable library collections? Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you all so much for engaging in that first prompt with us today. Um, to start off, I'd like to share PBS Wisconsin's mission. We have a commitment to serving all communities. We firmly stand against racism and we are intent on listening and learning to help inform our actions and our engagement efforts. Um, we believe that public media is a place for learning and sharing. We acknowledge that we occupy or broadcast to the lands of all 12 native nations here in our state. And our commitment to equity and access ensures that all Wisconsin learners can grow together. I'm going to offer our community guidelines for today's uh, session. We ask that today you practice um, and to lean into your sense of wonder, curiosity, and growth, and to listen deeply. Speak in I statements, 
reflect on potential impact rather than intention alone, to accept one another's reality and please maintain confidentiality. Participate to the fullest of your ability. Community growth truly depends on the inclusion of every individual voice. The goal here is not to agree, it is to gain a deeper understanding. Thank you. And our goals for today, uh, first, equip you with strategies for building communities with an anti-bias, anti-racist, and a universal design for learning lens. Secondly, to inform you of a dynamic, impactful, and intergenerational family learning framework from PBS Kids. And three, share resources for deepening your own understanding around race and racism. And the way that we're gonna achieve that is through what you'll see on the screen. We're gonna start off today's webinar. Um, section one is about growth and knowledge building. And so we'll begin by talk, discussing some shared vocabulary. So the terms that we're gonna look over are bias, racism, microaggressions, equity, and cultural humility. Um, there will be times for reflection and breakout rooms discussion integrated. Uh, then we'll talk about learning for all, equitable and inclusive facilitation. So we'll talk about uh, what some facilitation and planning strategies look like that include the principles of universal design for learning. And we'll have some reflection time to think about what the application of those principles look like in your own library and in your own community space. And then the second part of our webinar today will be resource sharing. So you'll hear from uh, Lacey on the incredible program that she's developed specifically for libraries. Mm -hmm. And you'll also learn more about the PBS Kids different models for community engagement um, and the ways that you might be able to integrate those into your communities. Mm. So we have a packed agenda. It is gonna be very dynamic. Like I mentioned in the beginning, there'll be a lot of opportunity for you to reflect digest, process, and connect with others. Mm -hmm. And so I really just wanted to reiterate one of our uh, community guidelines and invitations to really participate to the fullest of your ability, that community growth really does depend on the inclusion of every individual voice. So mm -hmm. if you're normally somebody who's a bit quieter, feel free to speak up, feel free to share your experience, um, because that will really make a difference in terms of how our conversations go. Um, mm -hmm. If you're in a breakout room, um, while I do always provide prompts before you're in a breakout room, uh, take the initiative to ask that prompt to the people in the room to call in those who might be a bit more quiet um, so that we can really grow together today. Mm -hmm. So we're starting off by talking a bit about shared vocabulary. And for those of you who have been doing, who've been on the diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, whatever acronym you might um, follow, um, no matter how many years you've been on it, I hope you know that just as I've been on this journey for years too, there are still always so many layers to unpack to unpack um, and to explore. And so even though some of this might, may feel, might feel redundant to you, if you are familiar with these concepts, I hope you can shift your lens a bit today, shift your perspective um, and really think about how does this apply to my work um, beyond just myself as a human being, but as a, a community practitioner, somebody who can create experiences for other people. Um, so I, I invite you to think outside the box a bit and really um, lean into some discomfort that that is inevitable when having these types of conversations. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is implicit bias. Um, implicit bias is the mental process that results in feelings and attitudes about people based on race, age, and appearance. And the truth is we are all biased. Mm -hmm. We didn't sign up for this, but we've been exposed to biases throughout our entire lives. Mm -hmm. Implicit bias is an unconscious process and often we are unaware of the negative racial biases that develop over the course of our lifetime. Mm -hmm. And they come from negative stories that we've heard about groups of people, the media, negative experiences, and implicit racial bias resides in our unconscious minds, the part of the brain that many believe is beyond our direct control. And unconscious attitudes about race are not the same as our conscious attitudes. And so, what does that mean in real life? It means that we believe we're better than that on a conscious level. We believe that we're not biased. That makes us feel better. That's a more comfortable place to live. Um, we believe we're good people and we most likely are for the most part, especially when it comes to the children that we adore. But to ensure that our unconscious thoughts are aligned with our conscious thoughts about what we value, we have to continue to engage in this work. It has to be a regular thing. It can't just be a one and done webinar. It has to be a journey that we continue um, to 
seek that evolution and that um, evolving in this work. And it's hard. It is not easy. It's uncomfortable. It's exhausting. But it has to be done so that we can make sure that we're enhancing all children's lives, all the young people that we are serving. Um, they deserve that. They deserve that from us. And so um, the reality is that our refusal to talk about and confront issues of race reinforce racial bias. And so however, we can bring it into our consciousness if we're intentional. And so that's really, um, I hope, why we're all here today. Um, the next term is race and racism. Race is a political and social construct that is fluid. Racial categorization can change over time, place, and context. Race has been used historically to establish a social hierarchy where individuals are treated differently, resulting in racism. What's really interesting is uh, the information I'm sharing today is from the National Human Genome Research Institute. And what they've shared is that genomic scientists are currently investigating the relationship between self-identified race and genetic history, genetic ancestry. And what is, has always been fascinating for me to learn is that there is more genetic variation within racial groups than between them, right? And so that really helps illuminate the way that race is a political and social construct. It was made up to develop this social hierarchy. And so Professor Audrey Smedley has a definition that I like, and she says, race is a culturally structured systematic definition of a way of looking at and perceiving and interpreting reality. And so, <clears throat> oh, I'm actually gonna skip this video. It's very cute and I'll share it later. Um, there are several different levels of racism, right? It's not just one way, right? And so I'm assuming that a lot of people typically think of racism, the racism that we hear about the, the most, is this personal racism, right? It's these private beliefs and prejudices and ideas that individuals have, and then these racist individuals do harmful acts towards people, and that's what we think of racism. But it exists on a much deeper level than that, right? And it is um, really brought to life through many different types of uh, levels of racism. And so there's personal, which is the private beliefs and ideas that individuals have. There's the interpersonal, which is, oh, my mistake. What I meant was the interpersonal is the expression of racism between individuals. There's institutional, which is discriminatory treatment, policies and practices within organizations and institutions. And then there's structural systems in which public policies, institutional practices, and other norms perpetuate racial group inequality. And we cannot get to structural, we cannot get to institutional, we cannot even get to interpersonal without yet having that first personal foundation of racism that is embedded because of implicit biases and the implicit biases that we're raised with. And so I know this font is super tiny and super difficult to read, but if you can just focus on this main circle, it really just shows the cycle of how implicit bias directly feeds into structural racism and how a cycle of structural racism directly continues to feed implicit bias. And it's a cycle that continues and will continue to evolve and continue through future generations unless there are people who disrupt it. And the people who disrupt it are people who take on what we call an anti-bias or an anti-racist approach. And you cannot be anti-bias and you cannot be anti-racist without that intentionality and without that active working against systems of structural racism. And so with that, um, one of the ways that racism can show up is through microaggressions. Um, I've certainly uh, had microaggressions thrown at me. I've certainly given microaggressions to other people. But microaggressions are manifestations of implicit bias. They are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial, gender, sexual orientation, and religious slights and insults to a target person or group. It's very typical that people who are in marginalized groups regularly or continuously experience microaggressions. And the thing that is really important to know about microaggressions is that people who are committing them are almost always doing it unknowingly, and they are almost always well-intentioned people. And so sometimes microaggressions are dismissed as innocent or innocuous, 
and they can be verbal and nonverbal. And so there are a couple of different ways that microaggressions show up. They can be micro insults. Micro insults are demeaning insults that convey a negative tone and send a message that a person does not belong, that they don't, that they're not welcome, that they're somehow an other. These acts often take the form of insensitive compliments like, you're pretty for a black girl, or you're Asian, you must be good at math. One that I've gotten personally is, you speak English really well, uh, to which I always respond in my head, well, I was born in Florida. Why wouldn't I speak English well? It's my only language, it's my first language. Such statements are usually based on stereotypes and they are, can be very subtle, pretty insensitive and very rude. I'll never forget somebody also had told me, um, this was back when I was a barista and he uh, was a, an older gentleman who said, hey, I just wanna let you know that you belong here. And so you can think about the level of, that's a really kind thing to say, but what's beneath that, right? What's beneath that? What he didn't realize is that he was actually othering me, right? And um, that's just a, a small example that I can share. The next is micro-invalidation. Micro-invalidations are statements that dismiss a marginalized person's expressed discriminatory experience and undermine or negate their thoughts or feelings. So examples of micro-invalidations include telling a person of color who might be talking to you about an act of racism they experienced, you're being too sensitive. Or are you sure that happened because of your race? Maybe they do that to everyone. Really, when a person of color is telling you about an experience that they felt, it's really our job to just listen and validate them in that moment. Micro assault um, is often intentional, unexplicit attack. So those are kind of those bigger gestures uh, that result in you know, slurs, jokes, name calling. Those are very intentional to hurt or target people. Um, these deliberate acts include using racial slurs, verbal attacks tied to race, intentional debasing of one race, excluding overlooking, or overtly showing disdain because of one's race. And so I thought it'd be helpful to share a few more examples of microaggressions. Asking a person where they're from, I get this one constantly, and I'll say Florida, and they'll say, no, where are you really from? And I'm like, Tampa, Florida. And then they're like, okay, but, but you know, you know what I mean. You know what I mean, where are you really from, right? Uh, the second is referring to a female professor as Mrs. while referring to a male counterpart as doctor, um, avoiding physical eye contact with a person because of a disability, a person of color, reacting with visible fear to men of color or those who might appear homeless, asking a multiracial person, what are you? Telling a person of color they speak good English, consistently calling someone by the wrong gender pronoun, excluding a person of color because of race, gender, or class. And so what can you do, right? I may have read something that you may have said to somebody. And the purpose of this is not to make you feel shameful, not to make you feel bad, but to think of, well, what can we do moving forward? And so although microaggressions are sometimes committed by well-intentioned people, the harm that it causes is not diminished. And so the intent that we may have had does not diminish the impact that the microaggression um, has caused. And so, it's really important to not try to justify our actions when this happens, because that can usually result in more microaggressions. So instead of justifying our intent, I encourage you to sit with your discomfort, actively listen to how the person was offended and commit to changing your behavior. And so there are a few ways you can also disrupt microaggressions if you hear them happening in your library or if you hear them happening in your workplace. Um, you can interrupt, you can question, you can educate, and you can echo. And so you want to be someone who speaks up. So you can practice saying things like, um, hey, that, that offends me, or I don't find that funny. You could say something like, I'm surprised to hear you say that. Um, you can be simple and straightforward. You can challenge bias by taking a vocal stand. So if somebody says something um, like, one that we heard earlier, you're Asian, so you must be good at math. You could say, well, what do you mean by that? Or why would you say something like that? Um, what did you mean by that, right? Really just helping interrogate um, and disrupt when you do here. So then lastly, there's equity. And um, equity as it relates to racial and social justice means meeting communities where they are and allocating resources and opportunities as needed to create equal outcomes for all community members. So notice this definition does not say giving everybody the same thing, right? It says meeting people where they are and allocating resources and opportunities 
as needed to create equal outcomes for all community members. Lacey, when we were uh, talking earlier, you mentioned something interesting about what people often think of when they hear equity. Do you want to share that? Yes. Yeah, so I, um, when I've been in conversations about equity before and asking, what is, what do you believe this is the definition of equity? Oftentimes I'd hear responses about equality as if um, equity and equality are the same, are the same thing. Whereas equality is really about everyone getting the same share of something and equ equality is, is wonderful, but then there are these lenses of equity where it is really meeting a person where they are at. And that, as it says here, that allocation of resources and the opportunities as needed so that equal outcomes is the result. So that is uh, what I've, I've heard often about it. Equity is very powerful and very meaningful in public library. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And you can see here, similar to the different levels of racism, there are different levels to equity. And so all we can do is encourage one another to work at that individual level. Because what we can believe is that if enough of us are doing this, that will climb down the ladder and we can eventually get towards that systemic change. So that was the shared vocabulary that was covering kind of the baseline, making sure that we're on the same page as we're understanding how can we create equitable libraries if we don't have a shared understanding of what equity is? How can we understand what equity is if we're not aware of what leads to a disruption of equity, if we don't know what leads to inequities, and that is implicit bias and its connection to racism? So now that we've covered that shared vocabulary, I want to encourage us to strive towards something called cultural humility. And I heard uh, cultural humility um, being referred to as a challenge which challenges us to become the student and engage in the practice of not knowing. And what I really appreciate about that framework and framing it that way is that as adults, we are often uh, thought to, that we're supposed to have the answers to everything, especially as we get older. And one of the best ways that we can better understand and respond to young people, to children and their families' deep cultural elements is to practice cultural humility. Because when we practice cultural humility, we're suspending judgment and we're interacting with each other more personally and within a cultural context. And so cultural humility requires us to humble ourselves, except that we are ignorant of other people's culture. We simply can't know everybody's culture. And the only culture we're going to know the best is our own because we live it every day. Um, but it's this willingness to learn. It's this willingness to accept what we don't know and be eager to listen and to learn. And so it's a practice of focusing on other people, the other person that we might be talking to, and elements of their culture that they identify as the most important to them. And so the principles of cultural humility are really a commitment to lifelong learning and critical self-reflection. And really, I see cultural humility as hand in hand with being anti-biased and being anti-racist, because these are almost identical principles to those two. So it's a commitment to lifelong learning and critical self-reflection. It's a recognition of and change in power imbalances. And it's a development of mutually beneficial partnerships. And so when, when I mention mutually beneficial partnerships, it doesn't mean inviting one of our Ho-Chunk neighbors in to read a story on Native November month. And then it's a one undone thing, right? But it's really setting up partnerships where both parties are benefiting um, from what we're offering. So maybe if you're inviting a storyteller in, what resource or service can you then offer their community, right? Thinking of those mutually beneficial partnerships. Um, practicing cultural humility can look many, many different ways, but broadly speaking, it means welcoming and encouraging people to bring their own experiences and dialogue with others, practicing active and deep listening, being aware of body language, how you might be pre presenting yourself as open to some, but kind of closed to others, knowing and owning what you don't know, understanding your boundaries and knowing when to ask for help, knowing when to ask for clarification. And one of uh, an activity that is rooted in cultural humility is a teacher uh, did this activity with their elementary school. I believe they were elementary or po possibly middle school students. And he wanted to learn more about his students. And so he gave them an activity where he asked them to fill out the prompt, I wish my teacher knew. And these were some of the responses that this teacher received. 
I wish my teacher knew I don't have pencils at home to do my homework. I wish my teacher knew that my family and I live in a shelter. I wish my teacher knew I am smarter than she thinks I am. I wish my teacher knew that my reading log was not signed because my mom isn't around a lot. I wish my teacher knew that my little brother gets scared and I get worried about getting up every night. I wish my teacher knew that my dad works two jobs and I don't see him much. I wish my teacher knew how much I miss my dad because he got deported to Mexico when I was three years old and I haven't seen him in six years. And so I share this activity because I implore you to think about what assumptions you might be making about the different patrons that are showing up in your library space. Noticing what type of bias, what type of assumption might be coming when you see a new neighbor, when you see someone who isn't a typical patron, or even if you do have a regular patron, what assumptions you might be making about them if you haven't invited that conversation. And so I thought that would be a helpful um, activity to share with you. And so now that we've done a lot of talking, and what I mean is now that I've done a lot of talking, I'd love to invite you to take some time to process um, those definitions that I went through. Um, and so we're actually going to go back to that Padlet activity. And what I invite you to do now is um, we're gonna head back to this Padlet and I have breakout rooms open and they are actually organized by these different buckets. Implicit bias, race and racism, microaggressions, equity and cultural humility. Whichever of those you are eager to talk to others about, I invite you to go into a breakout room for those and you can discuss there. And if you're wondering, well, what are we gonna talk about? Um, you're gonna talk about any of these four questions or whatever question or prompt you have that you wanna go into that room with. Um, but for those of you who like that structure, you're welcome to talk about any of these concepts. So if you go into the room that is labeled implicit bias, talk about how implicit bias shows up in your day-to-day -day work. Um, talk about how, what change or growth you're seeking to become more inclusive, particularly as it comes to bias. What change or growth are you currently seeking to make your library more inclusive? Um, what, what's showing up for you as we defined implicit bias? Um, so you're really just invited to um, reflect, ask questions or add comments under these buckets that connect to those different themes. If you go into the race and racism room, and then a question emerges related to implicit bias, that's okay, go ahead and add a question under there. That's okay, this is really just meant to help you process um, and reflect. And so I'll copy this link once more and I'll put it in the chat. Thank you so much, Ali, for sharing this book recommendation. Um, they shared about, she shared about a, an activity and a picture book that's called, I Wish You Knew. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to shop sharing my screen. Hello everyone, nice to see you. All right, let's keep talking. We're gonna head into sharing about um, learning for all equitable and inclusive facilitation. So this is where um, we'll begin talking about uh, facilitation strategies, recommendations, and universal design for learning. And so to begin, um, I'll share that inclusive design is Defined by des defined as a design methodology that enables and draws on the full range of human diversity, um, and so you may have seen a graphic similar to this show up in many different ways. It might be a baseball field, it might be a bicycle, um, and it might have different headers up there. Um, but this is just another graphic that symbolizes equality is giving everyone the same thing, right? But that doesn't work for everyone who has different needs that need to be accommodated. And so this is accessible or this is equitable, right? It's providing people what they need based on their needs. Um, universal design, inclusive design, equity um, is really um, removing the barrier, removing the barrier to begin with. Um, and then universal design for learning, we'll dive into really what that looks like next. Um, and really it's, it's different ways of engagement, um, different ways of sharing information. And so universal design for learning stemmed from inclusive design. So way back in, in the 90s, um, when folks in different organizations were talking about inclusive design, educators began to think about, well, what does that look like for students and learning? And that's where universal design for learning came from. And it's really about understanding the diverse strengths and needs of your audience of learners. It's about identifying when current designs may present unintended barriers to participation in learning. 
and it's recognizing the importance of providing multiple options for sharing information, multiple options for engaging your audience, and defining your expectations, being flexible in the design of your activities. And there are four positive outcomes when you, when you approach and apply universal design for learning, which you'll often see as UDL. And it's that all children feel welcomed as full and equal members. It's that all children feel access and fully engaged in all learning opportunities. It's that children are able to learn according to their individual strength and interest. And children are able to demonstrate learning in ways that reflect their individual strengths and preferences. And PBS Kids has been working with universal design for learning experts to ensure that our resources, our learning materials, our video games and apps incorporate universal design for learning elements. And so when we're thinking about engaging the why of learning, our resources are gonna be built to connect with kids' life experiences and to help them transfer what they learn to the real world. And you can also think about ways that you can apply your programming in these same ways. Give kids choices about what and how they play so that you can gain and maintain interest. Minimize distractions. Make goals clear and offer varying levels of challenges. Provide specific feedback to help children build skills and strategies and reflect on what they've learned and encourage children to keep trying, especially when they struggle. So this is engaging with the why of learning. And then inform the what of learning, representing information in multiple ways, using texts, pictures, symbols, and more, using different media and approaches to reinforce key ideas. So maybe that's a book in the beginning, a clip later on, um, providing information with audio and visual support. So today, even on our Zoom screen, you see us presenting, but we also have closed caption enabled too for folks who might be hard of hearing. Define or offer contextual support for understanding challenging vocabulary. Understanding that kids may not have essential background knowledge, so being able to provide that. And making the content available in multiple languages. And then there's the how of learning. Giving kids multiple ways to show what they know helping them to feel a sense of accomplishment by giving them different ways to problem solve, create, and share. Exploring new and different ways to help kids respond to and interact with content that uses a variety of senses and inputs like touch, speech, gesture, and helping kids set goals and monitor their progress. Um, it's also becoming aware of and support supporting assistive technology tools like screen readers and adaptive controllers, um, just different types of technology that exist to make learning experiences that you might be providing more accessible. Um, I'm going to skip this brief act, uh, activity just because of time. Um, and so something that I wanted to encourage you when you're thinking of designing and um, designing equitable and inclusive programs is who has a seat at the table when it comes to planning and how might you be able to diversify who is there? How might you be able to invite community members at the table, to the table, um, to help inform programming, to make it as responsive as it can be, especially if you're having trouble engaging a certain audience, right? I have the pleasure of working with libraries all around the state of Wisconsin. I work with libraries that are super duper tiny and work with libraries that are absolutely huge and a lot of them have the same issues, right? We really wanna serve homeschooled families. We really wanna reach Spanish speaking families. There is always a group of people that they feel like is missing and they want to be able to serve them. How might those families feel excluded or not feel invited to the table? So this question really poses, have you had the opportunity to be with, work with and learn alongside children and adults with diverse abilities, experiences and backgrounds? If not, who might you wanna to invite to assist in planning and preparing your programs? So there are different examples here. Could be parents of children with disabilities, parents of children who are English language learners, parents of children who are of a different race or from a different culture than yours, special educators or bilingual educators. Um, additional recommendations are taking the time to ask questions and listen, going back to that cultural humility. Um, and so thinking about what are potential barriers um, that might exist? What might make children feel excluded? So you wanna catch yourself before saying, and I hear this way too often, is that won't work, or that's not the way we've done things before, right? That's a barrier. Things aren't gonna change if you have that mindset. 
So you want to strive to honor everyone's participation by trying out at least one suggestion from new members if it's reasonable. And so you might frame it as, we've never done that before. Let's try it out and see how it works. Or let's imagine together what that might look like. Let's break that down, right? How well can participants truly access all aspects of your programs? Thinking about the physical asset, physical access, um, room arrangement. How well can people enter the space? How can they register or sign up? How can they collect the materials they're going to need? How are they going to find a place to sit? Have you physically walked through the layout in the shoes of different participants? Someone who might be in a wheelchair, a child who might be using a walker, a grandparent who might be using a cane, a parent of active preschoolers. If you're having different play activities, how are participants able to access the materials? If an activity asks participants to move from one location to another in your library space, how might that present unintentional challenges? Are there ways you can remove some of those challenges, like having all the materials at one table or having them be distributed by volunteers? Can you find adaptations that enable access by everyone, having different materials that accommodate children with different motor abilities? Are these questions we can ask our planning team members who might have physical disabilities to help us answer? Right, so thinking about that physical access piece. And then there's the social aspect piece. How well does your space create a sense of community where all members feel welcomed, included, and engaged? How well do we communicate with all families in our community that they are welcome to join your program? To what extent do your recruitment materials represent the diversity of people who live in your community? Do your registration materials respectfully ask families to share any accommodations they might need, any support they might need, similar to how we might ask, you know, about dietary preferences? Are there clear expectations for all volunteers, all staff, and all participants that everyone is welcome and that any discrimination or negative remarks won't be tolerated? Can you set up community guidelines for your workshops, for your programs? And then does the physical space and seating arrangement allow everyone to sit and participate in a way that they choose, which might minimize involuntary grouping based on children's ability levels or based on race or based on culture? So those are a few things to think about when designing equitable programs is the physical access piece and that social access piece. And so to think of applying the universal design for learning principles, it is making sure that you have multiple forms of sharing information, right? We typically use spoken and written English to convey important information, to, to convey guidance and feedback. But when you're thinking of planning and preparing, how can you ensure that new or developing English language learners are able to access and understand the information and materials you provide? If you have a, a growing Hispanic population in your area, can you make sure that everything's available in Spanish? Can you work with different service agencies who work with Spanish speaking families to make sure that they're aware of the programs you might be running? Um, can you make sure that different, um, maybe other languages are um, in your community are, um, the materials are available in those languages too? Are there people in your planning committee who might speak those languages who can assist? Another recommendation um, is to have all the materials at your program at a sixth grade level, reading level, to ensure a broad understanding by all families. Because we know that everyone's coming in with their own different educational background, their own understanding and, and uh, skills related to literacy. So the general uh, recommendation is to write all materials at a sixth grade reading level. And there are actually uh, word processors like Word, Microsoft Word, that have a spelling and grammar check function that can also provide an estimated reading grade level. So that's how you can kind of figure out baseline. Um, what the, the grade level your um, materials are at. Um, let's see, consideration for these guidelines should also apply to all signs and materials provided at the workshop. So if you're having a flyer that's up in Spanish, you also wanna make sure that now that the Spanish speaking families are coming, that you have some materials at the, the, the program that are also in uh, Spanish. And another really um, important and easy thing to do is consider using both pictures and symbols along with the text to convey important information, right? So maybe even if you aren't able to translate a bunch of things into Spanish, people can understand images. So maybe have images of what you want them to do um, conveyed. Um, so multiple forms of um, communication, multiple forms of sharing information is that first universal design for learning principle. And the other is multiple forms of engagement, right? And so, 
um, considering diverse skills, abilities, and experiences of children and families. Um, and so you want to make sure that in your programs, you are developing learning activities that challenge all children that aren't too boring or too easy for some that might not be too frustrating or too difficult for others. And so you want to establish clear learning goals for all children and take time to break down those learning goals uh, to accommodate children at different skill levels. And the way you might do that is by planning activities for both older and younger siblings. One of my favorite programs to lead um, is called Play and Learn Science. And in one of the um, activities, we're having children build a ramp. And they're using recyclable materials. They're using cardboard. So it might be shoe boxes, it might be cereal boxes, um, just broken down cardboard. And then they have other um, adhesives. They might have glue, they might have duct tape. Um, and we might have you know, plastic bottles, just an assortment of recycled materials. Um, and what I love about a simple activity like that um, is that children can make that really, they can take it at a really simple baseline. Um, and older children or children who might have, um, who might need something more challenging can make that into a really complex activity. And so I've seen children using an egg carton um, and building a super simple ramp, just watching their ball go down the egg carton and practicing moving the ball down. And I've seen children who wanted more of a challenge building really complex ramp structures, right? And so thinking about what type of activities can be really intentionally structured to accommodate children, um, their different needs and their different learning abilities. And the other thing is that um, activities that connect with children's life experiences are a lot more likely to foster that transference of skills. And so thinking about how you can um, accommodate and connect with um, the activities and the life experiences um, and the things that might just show up in a day-to-day -day life of the young children that you might be serving. Um, and then lastly, multiple forms of guiding participation and action. So providing multiple activity options, right? At any of the PBS workshops that I help lead, um, what you'll find across the spectrum for all of the different guides that we offer for free is that there are always multiple activity options. There is gonna be an area where you're building a ramp. There's gonna be an area where you can just look through different books that connect to different concepts connected to ramps. So it might be about ramps, might be about building structures. It might be about friction. Um, there is an activity center where they might just be able to color um, there's an activity center where they can just practice rolling different objects. And so having those multiple activity options really is crucial for accommodating different interests and different abilities. So that's what that app, those applications of the universal design uh, for learning principles can look like. And we are already at an hour, which is incredible. Lacey, I can't believe that we, we might have needed more time for this. Um, but that's okay. What I really want to take time for now, and we'll just do this, we'll just take five minutes for this activity before we jump into the resource sharing where you're gonna learn from Lacey different library resources you can use um, to help build your own um, base. Um, I invite you to think about how you can apply some of these universal design for learning principles to programs that you might already be offering. Um, what changes can you make to your planning and design process to create inclusive programs? Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is I am going to open up breakout rooms one more time. And um, this time it'll just be random. So you don't have to join, you know, a specific, um, you know, title. And you'll just have five minutes to just share out what will these look like? What current programs you have at your library? And what might it look like to apply some of these universal design for learning principles um, at your current libraries? or learning spaces. So go ahead, hop in there, and I'll come into some of the different rooms too, just to see how things are going and remind you of the time. People are just gonna be cycling back in the next 40 seconds or so here, okay. and then I'll pass the mic. Okay, sounds great. Everything is so wonderful. Thank you so much, Muna. Yeah, thank you for being. Absolutely.
Let's see, 15 more seconds and we'll have the rest of the gang back. Mm -hmm. All right, welcome back everyone. So what we're gonna do with these final 15 minutes we have, um, oh my gosh, I can't do math, 25 minutes, is um, Lacey is gonna share about her Community Beyond Bias library resources. And then I'm gonna share about um, some really incredible free PBS Kids resources that you can utilize in your library that already integrate Universal Design for Learning into it. So you don't have to have that planning on your own chest, it's done for you. Um, so be sure to stick around and Lacey, it's all yours. Okay, super. Let me share my screen here. Okay, well, what I am happy to offer to you all today is an overview of creating community beyond biases library resources. I'm Lacey Sheldon, and I'm here at McIntosh Memorial Library, which is in Viroqua, Wisconsin. So creating community beyond library, uh, creating community beyond biases library resources is essentially a programming series that I developed in 2020. And of course, during 2020, there was the COVID-19 pandemic, and there were also national discussions at the forefront uh, about racial and social justice matters. And during the shutdown time of COVID, I really was wondering what is within the scope of library staff to address racial and social, social justice matters. And I thought that supplying books and other educational materials is well within the scope of library staff. And also to create book lists and put them on display and also within the scope of library staff to address the matters are to host, um, well, libraries do host presentations and programs very often. So therefore I thought it was completely possible to host community members and formal educators to present on the matters of racial and social justice and diverse identities and cultures of the world. And our library is known as a trusted place in our community for access to all types of resources and is also a place for connection, engagement, and education. So while I was pondering all of that, that led me to the heart of the matter. Could the content of books and presentations foster transgression of personal biases? And if this occurs often enough, could it create a community beyond biases? And that is what helped me shape this programming series. And I realized the importance of all of it and developed this overarching program that would use books and presentations to express individual voices and authentic lived experiences. And to be able to present this program, creating community beyond biases library resources to our patrons who are interested or may be interested uh, for the goal of better understanding, to increase education, and to transgress biases. So again, Creating Community Beyond Biases is a programming series for all ages that runs the course of a year. Let's see here. Hmm. So I'm, I'm having a, I'm not able to, advance to the next slide. Let's see here. Hmm. Well, I'm having some technical. Do you uh, want to try um, like stop sharing and then share again? Yes, let's do that. There we go. Oops. All right, so all the voices. There are a lot of voices and experiences at the table, if you will, when considering racial and social justice and diverse identities and cultures of the world. And while I was designing out this program, I knew it would be counterproductive to leave out voices. 
So I resolved this by creating a 12 month calendar for the program. And the calendar is effective at organizing the table, if you will, and providing structure to focus on efforts. The program's calendar acknowledges a heritage or history or an awareness of a cause on a monthly basis and also includes special days of recognition. Uh, the calendar is also flexible. So you'll see here in a moment when I share the calendar that there is a heritage or a history or an awareness of a cause for each month. And of course, when we're um, talking with and approaching different individuals to present for these months, if they're not able to present in one month, they're certainly welcome to join and present at any, at any point. Uh, one thing that's really important about uh, this program that was developed is that it is self-directed and there's also a broad range. What I understand is that individuals search for library resources that match where they are at on their level of education uh, about uh, topics and points of racial and social justice. So therefore, I uh, arranged book lists that are, covers a wide range of books and scheduled a wide range of presentations from introductory to in-depth. Uh, an example of introductory would have been cultural classes that were presented about cooking or music, language, arts, or dance. And there were also in-depth uh, presentations and workshops and classes for opportunities to discuss anti-bias, racial, and social justice matters. And this was for patrons of all ages could then be self-directed to a book or a presentation to match where they were at on their own journey of understanding. So um, again, Creating Community Beyond Biases Library Resources is an overarching program. It is a programming series that uses a calendar. The calendar organizes a year's worth of monthly acknowledgments. Each month, a history or heritage or an awareness of a cause is acknowledged by the library. And how are they acknowledged? by showcasing books and hosting presentations. Okay, we're gonna stop share and share again. Sorry, that's happening folks, I'm not quite sure why. So when it came to scheduling the calendar, I researched already recognized months that had been established by the United Nation, federal and state governments, university systems nationwide, and international and national representational organizations. And again, I strove for the calendar to be geographically inclusive of the world. And to accomplish that, I also added in special days of recognition, which also got their own book list, displays, and presentations. So this is that year long calendar. Uh, in January, the library acknowledges East Asian Heritage Month with special recognition of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. February, Black History Month with special recognition of Lunar New Year. March, National Women's History Month. April, Arab American Heritage Month. May, Southeast Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Also in May, there's special recognition for Australia Heritage Day and Africa Day. June is 2S LGBTQIA plus Pride Month. July is Jewish American Heritage Month, Ethnic American Heritage Month, and Asylum Seekers Awareness Month. And these three are with intent pair, uh, matched together so that patrons can draw their own conclusions about um, diaspora and uh, immigration historically and in modern times. August is Food Security Awareness Month. September, Latine and Hispanic Heritage Month. October, Disability and Mental Health Awareness Month. And November, American Indian and Alaskan Native Heritage Month. And finally, December, Universal Human Rights Month. So once again, as the library uh, Macintosh, we ran this program in 2021 and in 2022. And each month there were um, book lists 
prepared for each month and presenters, uh, local community members and statewide educators would come to present on these um, subjects. So about a little bit more about the book list and how I organized them. I really researched authors who want to share about their identities and experiences and purchased their books. Uh, to be put onto the book list, um, I really wanted them to be accredited, awarded books as well. I researched book lists from the following uh, resources you could see here, really taking a, a fine focus on book lists that were coming off of websites and being recommended to me through the connections I was making by social and racial justice organizations and also representational organizations. I was searching for books to put on the book list that express both modern and historical voices and international and national American voices. And I, I made book lists for all ages from um, the youngest all the way through adulthood. And connecting with the presenters, I started by taking a really strong local focus to foster connection within my own community. And the approach is so important. This was really a place for putting into practice those um, cultural humility principles that Muna has shared with us earlier today. Uh, when I was approaching the presenters, I knew that they would be personally connected to the acknowledgement of, of that month and really discussing with them that the library is a resource um, and inviting them to use the resource of the library's platform to present if they would like to. And it was really important that um, to, to really actively listen to what it was that they wanted to bring forward to present upon. I had no pres prescribed thought in advance about what I wanted them to present on, not at all. This was all about saying, hey, the library is a platform to host a presentation through, to outreach and present upon anything that you would like to. What do you want to say? What is in your, um, what is in your mind and your heart and what do you want to bring forward if you want to? Um, also reaching out to representational organizations and special interest groups. Uh, at the time of 2021 and 2022 pandemic times, uh, really wanting that goal of connecting with the representational and organizations and special interest groups to be that mutually beneficial partnership, where connecting with them was a gateway of starting those conversations of how, how can we be mutually beneficial to one another and saying, would you like to use this platform at this time to present uh, across the community and really get your mission and vision statement out there? Um, to to those who want to attend and be um, and listen, and that was really a gateway to connecting with some um, incredible organizations. Uh, another part of the presenters that were um, engaged in this program is that they were either personally connected to that acknowledgement or someone who has dedicated their life to it as well. Um, and one other example is we hosted a few travel programs. And that was, could be a bit of an exception, but the travel programs, we really wanted people to come forward to talk about places they've been, if they had been there recently, and they had a very strong um, purpose of traveling there. Uh, one aspect that, of the program was a book giveaway that we hosted. It was a very innovative project. And this book giveaway uh, was in response to our patrons request that we host discussion groups about racial and social justice. So we did this through the lens of books. Uh, the Great Diverse Book Giveaway was um, funded by the American Library Association's Library Transforming Communities Grant. And what we did is we, we purchased um, newly published books about social, racial and social justice matters for our community members of all ages to read and own. So they came in and they chose their book and we literally gave them a book that they could keep. And that was with the agreement that they would return in about a month's time to a librarian led conversation about the books and the subject matters. Uh, this is a look at the books that we gave away. 
during that time. You can see some of the children, uh, teen books coming in. So every single one of these books was ordered and given out, which was really fantastic. And then we came back together for our discussion groups that were held in our courthouse lawn. The attendance and return rates to the discussion groups were really excellent. The photograph here is, is one of the small groups that um, had broken out for further discussion about their books and the books led into talking about deeper matters. Uh, for this um, event, we also invited the representational organizations to lead some of these small group discussions. We had large group discussions, small group discussions, and we had a children's circle as well. So we definitely asked for feedback on the event, and one of our community members said this event really helped break the ice for being brave and entering into conversation. It may seem like a small thing, but it's not. It's huge. Thank you for your efforts to help us take baby steps to finding our strength and balance so we can keep this work going. So what was important about this is that our library, we had found a method to host discussion groups about racial and social justice issues that were within the scope of library and library staff. So we had some wonderful outcomes of hosting Creating Community Beyond Bias's Library Resources Program. Uh, because of our efforts with that, uh, our city council approved an additional employee to join our staff. I really felt like the confidence of our staff in reader advisory and promotion really um, turned up quite a lot. And we were advocating that our library is a safe and welcoming place. We have seen many new card holders come forward. Organizations now approach our library for its resources, book lists, and to present. The program reached 14,000 people in 2021, and that number became quite large because of the presentations that were occurring throughout the years uh, were videoed and recorded and put out on our YouTube channel. And we were also involved in hosting very um, a Dia de los Muertos celebration, and those numbers are included in that. So we have certainly integrated the calendar that I've shown you into our planning process for future years. However, we are really looking at reshaping the elements of this program to align with the current and appropriate methods of reframing. And certainly one of the outcomes was that the library could serve as an instrument of equity. Uh, we were awarded a state award for the program by the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation for best diversity and inclusion in the state of Wisconsin in 2021. Uh, I was able to present on it with uh, the library director at the American Rural and Small Library Conference in Chattanooga, Tennessee this past June. And it was uh, one of the main components that went into our nomination for the 2022 Library of the Year Award as well. So thank you for that. I know it's, um, I just wanna say thank you for letting me explain that. It, what I'd like people to know mostly is that that entire programming series is very intentional and it does put to work a lot of what we've discussed today with equity and really putting out there that invitation to people that they can step forward to use that library's resource of presentation and to really put into practice um, equitable measures to invite people into the library because libraries are for everyone. And it really did, um, I feel like it strongly did <clears throat> achieve some goals of developing a sense of belonging for all at the library and really worked towards those uh, developing mutually beneficial partnerships. A lot of the representational groups and organizations that we worked with for this, we have continued um, partnerships with them and have been able to step into their um, communities and into their platforms to be able to offer our public library services. And 
Yeah, it has been an incredible journey connecting with so many people over the past few years and really being able to sit back in humility and learn from others. And through, it is an all ages program. And I can speak more specifically about the children's programs at a later point. Um, the children's programs were really, really phenomenal. Uh, what we went through with the children and really um, getting to dive, dive in deep with our presenters with them was really powerful. So um, as mentioned, uh, we did, I did present this at the American Rural and Small Library Conference. And I know that since that presentation, uh, libraries across the nation have picked up components of the program. And I can also, um, if anyone would like, I certainly would offer to talk about the program in more detail as well. Uh, there's a whole presentation and an advisement role, if you will, that can come, um, that is available to anyone who is watching, is here today or watching the recording. So that is what I will share for now. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. If anyone has any questions for Lacey, please put them in the chat and we will be sure to follow up. Um, and then to end, I just wanted to highlight a few other resources you can utilize in your library. Um, like I mentioned, these are play tested, field tested, beloved by families, beloved by libraries, used all around the state. Um, and they are incredibly effective at leveraging that universal design for learning principles because they are already integrated into the planning. And so all of these, uh, particularly our family resources, they come with complete guides, everything you'll need to to bring these to life that already integrate those different modes of engagement. They'll be available in Spanish. They are very heavy in text and symbols. They um, have multiple activities for a variety of learners. So I highly encourage you to um, spend some time later on today, later on this week, exploring these. The first is our family and community learning workshops, which are multi-generational family engagement programs for families with kids ages three through five or five through eight. Each hands-on workshop uses creative play and multiple forms of media to spark exploration and STEM and literacy concepts, as well as social emotional learning. And so through child-centered activities and experiences, the workshops foster collaboration, communication, and problem-solving skills. Here's an example of what a sample schedule might look like. We share a meal, there's exploration time where the concept is introduced, a story is read, a clip is watched. There are different centers that families can go to where they're making and taking something, investigating concept, uh, engaging in some sort of media literacy and digital play. Um, family share out and then goodbye. So that's a sample uh, schedule. We have tons of different options. You can see the different themes that align there. Um, you will all have access to these slides after our presentation. So I encourage you to go through and take a look at these and think about how these might um, work for your community. If you wanna bring any of these to life at your community, reach out to me, send me an email and I can help support you to, to bring these to life. Um, so we have family series around informational text, space science, social emotional learning, coding for kids, science inquiry, work it out wombats is a new one that we're working on right now. It's all about computational thinking. Um, and there are additional FCLs on gardening, financial literacy um, and more. And so if you visit that link down there, pbslearningmedia.org, and you type in family and community learning, you'll find all the different options for you that you can utilize in your library next week. That's how easy they are to use. So definitely give those a check. Um, definitely check those out. We also have a camp guide. These can be used during um, any sort of school breaks or during the summer. Um, so they are five full day camp experiences for children ages five through eight that explore STEM literacy and SEL. Um, and again, they integrate hands on activities and media engagement with videos and games to really encourage children to play, build and explore. Um, they're very modular, so you can take and leave out pieces. You could make half days. You could make it into a two hour thing. Um, you can really just change it up to accommodate the needs of your community. Um, and so these are the different camps that we have that you can explore for free. All of our resources are free. So you could do a camp around math, engineering design, social emotional learning, reading, career exploration, science and career space science. Um, so again, just amazing, amazing fun resources. And then lastly, PBS Wisconsin hosts different ed camps all around our state that bring together people who work with early learners. They're free professional development events that leverage the knowledge and experience of attendees. Um, 
to collaboratively to determine topics for discussion during the event. Um, and they are just participant driven, participant led, and they're wonderful. So if you'd want to host one of these in your community, let me know and we can connect. Here are a couple of examples of recent ones that we've had. Um, and you can explore these later on. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go through these resources because we are at our end, um, but please be sure to check out our Padlet where we have listed here, if you scroll down to the end, um, the resources, you can find the slide deck here. You can mm -hmm. find that infographic on how PBS supports um, all learners and you can find Macintosh Memorial Library um, where you'll find the Community Beyond Bias resources. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was talking yeah. so fast. <laughs> I wanted to add, Muna, that um, on the Macintosh Memorial Library's website, all of the book lists that were created for that uh, for that program are listed there. So if you're looking for book lists to get you started, that could be a good option for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are at time. There's a poll that's up on your screen. So please, please answer those quick three questions. We appreciate you so much for spending the last hour and a half with us. Take care. We'll be sending out an email with the side deck, the recording, and all that good stuff later. Thank you all so much, and I hope to see you at another webinar soon or mm -hmm. in person. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining thank today. You. Thank you. Thank so you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.